And so what we can do next is add to Marx's argument. Marx just what we've done so far is we've we've summarized Marx's argument, which is a technological argument for a growing reserve army. Marx's Marx's argument is is centered around a growing composition of capital, and 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 in his formulation, the composition of capital is growing as a result of technological and organizational changes. Right. That's why the composition of capital is growing. That's why the reserve army is growing within Marx's theory. However, we can actually add a whole nother reason for a growing reserve army and a whole nother re because we have a whole nother reason for swings in the composition of capital independently of technolo technology of or, or organization. We actually have, uh, with our observations about disproportionality and our attempts to complete what Marx was doing in volume two, we can add a whole nother dimension to this argument. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to bring up Desmos one more time and we're going to, uh, I'm going to click I'm going to go to the, the what is linked in the video description as the final Desmos app, which is just the just the model that we made in the la, in the video on volume two stuff, the the disproportionality model. So I'm going to go ahead and bring that up, and if you want to bring it up too, go ahead and and jump into that with me. So if you click the Desmos app and you're following along with me, what you should see is exactly this at first. And let's recall what we have here. What we have are um, what we have are the growth paths, the equilibrium growth paths uh, for a capitalist economy in which you have a capital goods department and a wage goods department. The capital goods department has a, has a composition of capital of 1.5. The wage goods department has a composition of capital of 3.6. We have a rate of exploitation, which is one. We have a rate of surplus reinvestment, which is constant at 0.5. Um, and we have a, an initial value output from the two departments. Initially, you have a value uh, output of one from the capital goods department and 0.67 from the wage goods department. And what we have here as these curves is if the capitalists want to continually reinvest half of their surplus value um, and always have what they need in order to do that. In other words, to the extent that the capitalists will successfully reinvest the way they will naturally want to reinvest and also maintain constant supply demand equilibrium, to the extent that they successfully do that, they will be bound to these blue and red curves. The capital goods department will be forced onto this curve and the wage goods department will be forced onto this curve. That's what we found here. That's what these curves are. And these balanced growth paths are just kind of there to make a point. You can see that this is the ideal kind of thing that the capitalists would want. They would want to grow like this, um, but you can see that the, that the balanced growth path is unstable. No matter how close you start on it, you're going to be kind of flying off of it eventually violently. And we actually justified why these curves were going to do what they do kind of in terms of the differing compositions of capital between the two departments. We noted that the, 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 the types of curves you get are completely different depending on whether the composition of capital for the capital goods industry is bigger or smaller than the other one, than the composition of capital for the wage and, and, and labor goods department. And the reason that you get this oscillation here, the kind of intuitive reason for it, is that here what we have is that the capital goods department is more labor intensive and the labor goods department is more capital intensive. In other words, they're overly dependent on each other. And so you get these kind of overcompensating swings back and forth. And, and so, to, so to understand how uh, the argument we're about to give uh, is going to influence and, and add on to Marx's argument, we really have to understand and be very clear on what stuff is constant, what, what things are being held constant within this model. So the things that are being held constant here are the rate of exploitation, uh, the rate of surplus reinvestment, and most importantly, the compositions of capital of for the individual departments. K1 and K2 here are not changing with time. Um, and, and, and K1 here, this is the composition of capital for the capital goods industries. And remember, we found K1 by basically taking the average of the composition of capital for every individual industry within the capital goods department. And so by keeping these things constant and seeing them as parameters that determine these curves, what we have is a model which completely excludes anything other than simple accumulation. There is no reorganizing and there is no technological innovation happening. Uh, the methods of production are staying constant throughout this entire process. In other words, if we note in, the, in this model changes in the co overall composition of capital for society, uh, then those changes in the composition of capital are, a reason f are, are reasons for a changing composition of capital, which have nothing to do with anything that we just talked about. It'll be a completely different reason for a changing composition of capital, and a completely different reason, if, if, if that has a bearing on the reserve army, then a completely different reason for a growing reserve army, or a shrinking reserve army, or whatever end we end up finding here. 
And so that's, that's really important, I think, to keep in mind uh, from the get-go. And so the question we obviously have to begin with then is how could the composition of capital for society overall be changing if none of the compositions of capital for any industry individually are changing? And the answer is proportions, disproportions in, in, how, in, in what industries are being invested in and which ones are being neglected. That's the big difference. And in order to think about that, let's think about uh, the initial configuration for things. So at time equals zero, I have an, a, a value output from the two departments. I have a total value output of one from the capital goods department and 0.67 from the, from the wage goods department. In other words, for whatever reason, at the beginning, uh, at time equals zero, society seems to be favoring the capital goods industries over the wage goods industries. They just seem to have more uh, there's just more investment, there's more activity going on uh, in the capital goods industries for whatever reason. Except that the capital goods industries have a lower composition of capital than the wage goods industries. And so the, dispar the, f the disproportionate favoring of the capital goods industries produces a more labor-intensive society because it, it produces a, a society with a lower overall composition of capital. And like, you know, when we get over here to this like swing at, at time equals two, um, we see that society goes even harder in that direction. It, 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 mass it, it suddenly massively over favors the capital goods department and under favors the wage goods department. And that, that's going to create um, a, a, a more, an even more labor intensive society than before. And when, it and when it flips the other way, when you get to time equals three and you get a complete swing in the other direction where society is just massively favoring the wage goods industries and massively disfavoring the capital goods industries, uh, well, the wage goods industries are more capital intensive. And so you get a more capital intensive society at this point. You get an overall higher composition of capital at this point. That's what you're going to see. And we can see that for ourselves by scrolling down into the um, other functions related to the system tab. So you click this little arrow here if the, if the folder isn't open and then scroll down to the K functions down here. So what we have here are first of all, the two, th these, these functions are kind of boring. These are the intra-departmental compositions of capital. So these are the average compositions of capital for the two departments. And as we noted, they're gonna be constant over time. And the reason that they're gonna be constant over time, I mean, I obviously they're constant within my model because I just wrote it that it's K1 here and K1 is a parameter of the system. But kind of the other reason for it is that what K1 really is, is it's the ratio of the total uh, constant capital invested in the capital goods department to the total variable capital invested in the capital goods department. And that num those numbers, if you think about them, are C1, uh, uh, C1, Y1 of T, right? That's the total constant capital of department one divided by V1, Y1 of T. Right, that's the total variable capital of the capital goods department, and and it doesn't like this because uh, it, it 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 because my y functions are defined piecewise, and so I, I have to actually just like write in everything over and over again because I define the initial functions piecewise. I can't plug them in with other functions. That's why these equations are all such messes. Uh, but but that's really what this is. If I did that, you can see immediately though that y one of t's the y one of t's cancel in the numerator of the denominator, and so what I end up with is just c one over v one little c one over little v one which is just K1, which is unchanging with time. And so the intra-departmental compositions of capital are constant. They're not changing at all. But if we turn on this big, this other K function, this is the overall composition of capital for society. And you can see that it's going to do exactly what we said it was going to do. So let's try to make sense of this blue curve here. And you can see, first of all, the first thing I want uh, us to know is that it is bounded inside of the rectangle kind of given by the two uh, departmental compositions of capital until at least it gets to this point. But um, we get, when it gets to this point, the graph becomes kind of uninterpretable because you can see by the time the blue curve like exits this like kind of boundary that's created by these two kind of dotted horizontal curves, it, it does that at exactly at the point where the wage goods department dips negative. And we mentioned that the graphs, we mentioned in the last video that these graphs kind of stop having real meaning uh, once the value outputs of the departments go negative, or honestly, once the value outputs of the departments go, go zero, because to have a, a, an output of zero from the wage goods department is to say that the wage goods department has stopped existing and nobody is producing any wage goods, which means everybody is starving. So, you know, there would be a crisis long before it gets to this point, or maybe right shortly before this gets to this point, right? This could be kind of seen as the crisis, this point right here, like 3.5. 
and so at that point what we mentioned is that uh, the, the interpretation has to be that like some kind of authority figure that can kind of uh, transcend the like normal rules of capitalism has to step in and and reset things to you know to some to some better proportion that better approximates balanced growth and then at that point you get another business cycle where you get another thing like this and then it kind of repeats itself um, but you can see that up until things dip negative the composition of capital overall is kind of a, a weighted average basically of the of the compositions of capital for the two departments it's in uh, it's in between and so initially it's actually it, it's way it's it's in between the two but it's closer to the capital goods department and the reason for that is because like we said initially society is favoring the capital goods department you have a, you have a total value output of one from the capital goods department and a total value output of something less than one 0.67 in the wage goods department so of that total you know so the proportion of total capital that's invested in more labor intensive departments less capital intensive departments uh is 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 bigger right there's there's more there's more activity going on in the more labor intensive sectors than in the more capital intensive success sectors and so what you have is an overall kind of lower composition of capital you have a composition of capital that is, is kind of closer to the blue the the capital goods composition than, than to the wage goods composition and, you know you can see again at, at, at period two when society you know swing uh, changes again and, and decides to massively favor the capital goods department over the wage goods department that's going to produce an even more labor intensive society because again the, the capital goods industries are more labor intensive and so you've produced a more labor intensive society and so you can see that the composition of capital dips even 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 lower than it was before and then society massively changes its mind and 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 decides to massively favor the wage goods industries at the expense of the capital goods industries and because of that society becomes more capital intensive because the composition of capital for the labor for the wage goods departments or the wage goods department is bigger it's 3.6 and so you end up being closer to this composition of capital of the weight of the labor goods industry you just end up with a higher composition of capital so the composition of capital is undergoing massive swings completely independently of any technological or organizational change in the firm it, it there's you know the overall macro effects going on in circulation are producing their own swings in the composition of capital that are completely independent of anything that Marx just noted and again, just to re I just I can't emphasize this enough that this is also independent of anything happening in, in, with supply and demand. This model assumes perfect supply demand equilibrium at all times. That's that's like the determining feature of this model. Um, so you know this is not capitalism going wrong. This is capitalism going right uh, by the by the by the political economist's own understanding of what that means. This is this is the ideal scenario according to them. Uh, and even in that scenario, and even without technolo technological change happening, you're going to get these swings. Um, by the way, I should probably mention, just as I did here, what this long, awful function here really is, is it's basically um, like C1, Y1 of T. I'm having trouble. C1, Y1 of T. So it's like the total constant capital in the, in the, in the, in the, in the capital goods department plus C2, Y2 of T. Yeah, that, that's the total constant capital of the... Uh, uh, wage goods department and it's basically all of that divided by like v1 uh, y1 of t plus uh, v2 y2 of t that's that's basically what i'm writing here uh just i have to do it piecewise because desmos does not like when you make a piece they, desmos hates it when you make a piecewise function and then like try to def try to define other functions in terms of that piecewise function so i've just kind of like redefine the functions every time and write the whole solution in which is annoying but that's really what i have here this is the composition of capital for the for the two department model so one other thing to note about the overall composition of capital is that um is what happens along the balanced growth path so the balanced growth paths are what the capitalists want and and we can observe just like before that the balanced growth path is is a good time for the capitalists and for the capitalist society um, but as we mentioned in the last video, it's it's literally impossible, like, you know, probabilistically impossible uh, to ever get on it. And so, um, uh, but if we, but nonetheless, if we check, you know, you can set y sub 2i equal to b sub g1 in order to, like, see what a balanced growth path looks like. And you can see that I, I just end up on those dotted lines that I was mentioning before. And the important thing to kind of observe here is that the composition of capital in that in that case is 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 constant. It's unchanging with time. It's just 2.13 nonstop. 
And the reason for that is the reason that we call it balanced growth. We call it balanced growth because uh, you can check the solutions for yourself and see uh, that um, when you have balanced growth, actually, we don't even need to check the solutions. You can just see right here. It, I, I, you know, to get to get to balanced growth, I fix like y one i equal to one, and then I set y two i equal to, you know, this number times y one i. In other words, b, you know, I start off as like some specific multiple of the original guy, and then that 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 and then that kind of persists. I'm, you know, what at all times this thing is exactly, you know, m one two over m one one times this thing. One is a, always a constant multiple of the other, and as long as one is a constant multiple of the other then the proportions are the same at all times. And since the proportions of the values are the same at all times, you end up with a constant composition of capital over time. And so, you know, a long balanced growth, this isn't an issue. And again, just to reiterate from the last video, you know, Marx couldn't find anything other than balanced growth. He couldn't do the math in order to observe the, the, the disproportionality growth that we've kind of, that you kind of get when you kind of complete what I think he was trying to do. Um, and, and you can actually, uh, one, one other thing you can do with the composition of capital, I'm going to set this back to 0.67, is you can scroll down again to the compositions of capital, and there's one more k function underneath the overall composition of capital, which is the composition of capital along the balanced growth path. So if you turn this on, you can see that, you know, this is the balanced growth path, the composition of capital is constant on it, and, and initially, like, you know, the capitalists did a good job after the previous crisis putting themselves, like, on to conditions that approximate balanced growth, but they didn't quite get it right. And so you have, you're, you're just a little bit off, you can see. But then as things kind of spiral out of control, just as the original curves, just as the actual curves spiral off of the balanced growth path, you know, you see the, the, you see the composition of capital spiral off of that balanced growth composition of capital, which is constant. You can see it kind of diverge, which is kind of neat. So now that we understand the composition of capital pretty well, let's go ahead and turn off everything but the real blue, the, but, the, but the kind of, uh, overall composition of capital. Turn off these guys and just leave this on. And then let's start to turn on the other stuff. So that maybe the first kind of uh, thing to turn on would be this P of T function. So this, this is the over, this is the value rate of profit. I, I say value rate of profit as opposed to the rate of profit experienced by the capitalists in money terms because we're assuming kind of an equalized rate of profit and, and, and a transformation already done from, from values into prices. And so that's a whole discussion of the transformation problem that I'm saving for the final video. But uh, let's not worry about that for now. Let's just worry about this P of T function. So we've got, uh, the, so we've got the, this, this, this actual value rate of profit, which is the rate of profit we've been talking about. It's just the total surplus value of the two departments divided by the total necessary uh, capital of the two departments. Um, and because the rate of exploitation is constant, we have the you know the the, the rate of profit p of t is equal to like the expect the the uh, the rate of exploitation like divided by you know the overall composition of capital plus one and you can see that the only thing that actually depends on time here since since the rate of exploitation is held constant right now for us is the composition of capital uh, and and the composition of capital is in the denominator so basically what you have with the rate of profit in this model and in our and in the other model is that Essentially, as, as the composition of capital gets bigger, it, the denominator here gets bigger, so the rate of profit gets smaller. And as the composition of capital gets smaller, well, again, it's in the denominator, and so the rate of profit gets bigger. And so you can understand what the rate of profit is doing uh, just by looking at the, uh, um, the composition of capital. So, for example, you, know, you see a, a dip here in the composition of capital around cycle two. And likewise, you see a small bump in the rate of profit at the same time. Because again, the, when the composition of capital falls, you know that's in the denominator, and so the, the rate of profit gets bigger, right? We know that when the composition of capital gets bigger, the rate of profit gets smaller. When the composition of capital gets smaller, the rate of profit gets bigger. So it gets smaller here, and we, that corresponds to a bump in the rate of profit. And then we see a big spike in the composition of capital and a, and a corresponding dip in the rate of profit. And so the value rate of profit is just kind of mirroring in reverse uh, the composition of capital. So you can understand what the rate of profit is doing without really saying anything extra. We've, you'll, you'll see that we've sort of explained all the curves already just by thinking about the composition of capital. Um, and and I've, I've, got, I've programmed in all the same stuff regarding the rate of profit as the composition of capital. You can look at the rate of, rates of profit of the two departments, see that the, rate of pro, the overall rate of profit is basically like a weighted average of the two departments, and, and it's kind of staying inside of there until uh, one of the departments goes negative. And so we kind of are, are kind of staying inside of that rectangle, just like the rate of profit. 
you can turn on this piece of B function, which is the rate of profit along the balanced growth path, and that kind of gives you the exact same sort of picture uh, that we had um, you know, for, for the composition of capital. As long as you're on the balanced growth path, everything is kind of steady. Uh, you know, obviously the balanced growth rate of profit is going to look a lot like the, 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 the actual rate of profit, and then as we leave the balanced growth path, we start to spiral off of the balanced growth path rate of profit while staying inside of the rectangle of the, of the constant rates of profit that are technologically defined of the two departments. Uh, and then we kind of veer out of it when things turn into a crisis. None of that's particularly important though. We're not super concerned with the rate of profit, but what we are concerned with is the rate of accumulation, which is just A times the rate of profit. So I'm gonna keep the rate of profit on for just a minute and turn off the other two. And then I'm gonna scroll up to uh, G. Here's the rate of accumulation. You can see I defined it in the in the more line roundabout way, but you're gonna see you're gonna see it has all the same dynamics that we talked about before, because it's literally just a times the rate of profit. So you can see it's just the rate of profit. It it, it kind of does the exact same stuff, but it's a little damped because it's multiplied by like a half because a is a half right now. But but you know by understanding the rate of profit, you can understand you know why the rate of accumulation looks the way it does. It, it just kind of mirrors all of the actions of the rate of profit, which itself is mirroring in reverse the actions of the uh, the composition of capital. And so now that, with that said, I'm going to turn off the rate of profit and turn on the real star of the show, which is the demand for labor, um, which is somewhere. Here it is. So here, this green curve is the demand for labor. And I know this is starting to look insane. But maybe maybe you maybe you like that it looks the same because maybe you're happy that you can understand all of this stuff if I did my job right we'll see, um, but you know let's 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 but to understand this at first let's add a few digits to basically be more on the balanced growth path I'll put like 0.6741 uh, maybe maybe eight you can see again that as long as the composition of capital is unchanging. We still have what we said before: accumulation of capital is increase in the proletariat. In other words, the, uh, the 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 demand for labor and the rate of accumulation, as long as the cap composition of capital overall is staying steady and unchanging, they're the same curve. The demand for labor and the rate of accumulation are identical. They are the same thing. Uh, up until we start to leave the balanced growth path and, and, and the overall composition of capital starts to change due to disproportions between the two departments. So let's try to understand that. So I'm going to go back to my less stable version of this. And um, so let's start out trying to understand uh, this dip in the composition of capital and what that means for the demand for labor. Now, this is a little confusing. I got kind of confused by this at first because you know, you've got a dip in the composition of capital. That means that your society is becoming more labor intensive for a while. The reason it's becoming more labor intensive is because if you look at the outputs from the two departments, uh, the capital goods department is being favored at the moment and because it, and the capital goods department is more labor intensive. And so the, the wage goods department, the more capital intensive industries have shrunk and the, the more labor intensive industries have become more popular. And because of that, you have a dip in the composition of capital, which means you have a more labor intensive society. And so that should correspond with an increase in the demand for labor, right? Because you have a more labor intensive society. But that's actually not what we see here. We see that the rate of pro the, the demand for labor is actually dropped significantly at this point. In fact, it's gone negative. So what's up with that? Well, the thing you have to understand in, is that these, we're kind of thinking causally backwards here when we do the line of logic that I just gave. This purple curve and this red curve are the outputs of the two departments. At the beginning of the period, this is what society has created. And we're looking at the composition of capital as basically like a result of like taking all of the commodities have been that have been produced. But those commodities were produced in the previous period. So what these outputs are is that they, they are the product of the production cycle that was before it. And you can see that before this spike right here, you did have an increase in the demand for labor. It's, it's, we're, we're really kind of thinking about it backwards. Basically, this increase in the demand for labor is what creates this dip in the composition of capital at the at you know in in the next cycle. You know, you have to hire the you have to you have to hire the workforce in order to create the 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 product, right? And so what you're seeing here is the demand for labor spikes and then as a result of that, you get a dip in the composition of capital. You, the the workers get hired at a, at a higher rate 
And so you have a society that is more labor intensive. And so the output of the, of that society, if you look at, if you look at the composition of it, it is more labor intensive, but it's, it's caused the period before that at the beginning of the period when the capitalists go to market and they hire the workers. So the bottom line here, the end, the, the, the TLDR here is that, um, you're always going to see the changes in the composition of capital basically following the spikes and dips in the demand for labor. Like the, the spikes and dips in the demand for labor will always be like one step before the corresponding dips and spikes in the composition of capital and the outputs of the departments. So it so this dip in the composition of capital corresponds to this spike in the demand for labor. Likewise, this gigantic spike in the composition of cap capital corresponds to this gigantic dip in the demand for labor. And this gigantic dip in the demand for labor is negative. 16% of the workforce gets laid off here. So why is this happening? Let's be, let's be really clear about why this is happening. Again, all the same equations that we've done already apply. It's, it's not the fact that the composition of capital is increasing that is making the demand for labor negative here. What's, what's, what's making the demand for labor go negative here is the fact that the dips and spikes the, the, uh, of the composition of capital are becoming more and more erratic because this, you know, this, the, the composition of capital goes up at this point uh, and it creates a, a small dip in the demand for labor, but it's the slope of it is it, it's not a very much it's not very much of an acceleration. It's not a big change in the composition of capital. But as things get more and more out of control, the composition of capital changes more and more erratically, more and more quickly. It's the, it's the difference between this and this. It's the more it's it's the dramatic increase. It's the acceleration, right? The acceleration of the composition of capital is getting is getting more and more dramatic over time as these swings get more and more dramatic. And then finally, for, from periods two to three, you get such a rapid change in the composition of capital that, that the composition of capital is accelerating from here to here so quickly that it is enough to exceed A times E. And so at that point, you do get a, 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 spy, a, a dip into the negative for the demand for labor. The demand for labor goes negive. It goes to point, 17% it, 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 of the workforce gets fired and then what happens? You know, you might you might go on to think, okay, sure, you know, the demand for labor goes negative here, but you know, then they're just gonna all be hired again when the when the swing goes the other way. And indeed, you do see the demand for labor go uh, go crazy here to an even greater degree. So now there's an even higher demand for labor, but then there's an even bigger uh, set of layoffs right after that. But the thing is, um, what we mentioned is that after this giant set of mass layoffs. And, and this set of mass layoffs does not correspond to new hires, right? After, you know, at, at the end of that, you know, after the layoffs have finished, society is just more capital intensive. So a, a big chunk of the workers that have been laid off are not going to find work again. But that's a crisis. At this point, we have a crisis of disproportionality and things reset. So what's, what's happening within this model is that you're hiring workers at a more or less steady rate until all of a sudden you fire a chunk of them and then you have a crisis. And then you reset things as we kind of described, and then you go back to hiring them only at a steady rate. So there's no reason to assume that that steady rate is going to account to like hiring, you know, at a, you know, if, when you go back to hiring them at a steady rate, why is it going to be the case that you hire all these unemployed laborers back into the workforce before the next crisis? You might get another round of mass layoffs uh, due to the disproportionalities before you've even like hired them all back. And so this crisis cycle might be producing on its own, even without a changing composition of capital at all, even without a falling rate of profit, you might actually end up getting uh, an increasing reserve army. And, and, and so that's what, that's what the guy who created, who came up with this model uh, insisted, Morishima. I think he's being a little disingenuous because he, he basically says, you know, since the, since the rises and falls in the composition of capital are guaranteed to get more and more dramatic, it's guaranteed to exceed the, the composition of capital, it's guaranteed to exceed the, the rate of exploitation times the rate of reinvestment, and then eventually you're going to get this dip into the negative. But that's a little disingenuous because, you know, at this point, you know, it's 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 uh, you're going to have a crisis and reset things. But it's it is um, if you if you take this argument and you pair it alongside the technological argument, I think you get finally like the full steel man of an argument for an increasing reserve army over time. When you put all of the observations we've made together, including this one, then you get a very, very strong case for a growing reserve army. Because think about it like this, right? We hire the, we hire the workers. We, you know, we get mass layoffs here, okay? Um, 
and then we reset things. Uh, you know, at that and at the point where we reset things, we're going to find ourselves with a giant oversupply of wage goods and a giant undersupply of capital goods. And so, like I said at that point, a large amount of capital is destroyed, and particularly the wage goods are destroyed, and we reset things back to some approximation of balanced growth. So at that point, uh, we keep the oops, we keep the um, uh, the capital goods at what they were, 0.317, and then we drop down the wage goods to whatever is, is necessary to look like, like to have balanced growth. So let's do that, 0.317, and then this needs to be point like 0.2137. You know, at that point, you know, okay, that's great and all, but it's likely at this point that technology has changed. And so what we can do is we can model that by just making these numbers bigger. Maybe maybe between the last crisis and this one, technology has changed such that k is like you know two point like three, and and k two is like four. And at that point, you know maybe the, at, at that point I need to change what this was. Maybe maybe enough wage goods are destroyed, so it's only like point one six five. Well, now you've had a bunch of layoffs, but now this demand for labor is permanently less lower. So it's 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 not you know if if you pair the arguments together, you know you end up restarting the crisis cycle with a lower demand for labor, and and so it's even less likely that you're going to be able to hire back all of the workers that that were laid off at the beginning of the last crisis, uh, before the next crisis, and so then you really do start to see what I consider kind of like the full argument for an increasing reserve army over time. So clearly things are getting a little climactic, and I want to summarize what I just said in kind of like a full story that is like the full Marxist, you know, breakdown theory. Um, I want to summarize that and bring in the, the crisis cycle and just kind of explain it all in English. But before I do that, I want to stay, I, I want to stick to this Desmos app just a little longer, uh, because uh, the real reason I think Morishima in the book where he develops this is pretty disingenuous is because he doesn't even consider the case when K1 is bigger than K2. Which is extremely strange because Marx's only own example has K1 being bigger than K2. But I, I cannot for the life of me find in the book anywhere where he justifies doing that. He just assumes K2, he just assumes K2 is greater than what K1 and continues like that. I, he says absolutely nothing about it. When K2, when K1 and K2 are, di are, are when, when K1 is bigger than K2, you get a completely different dynamic than just this like oscillating stuff. And, think, and it's really interesting. So I just want to kind of spend a minute like st focusing on that. If you don't care, then just skip ahead. But um, so let me jump to this to like four, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring this to like two. I think that's what Marx's was. Uh, and then let me go ahead and make these kind of something more reasonable. I'll make this one, and I'll make this um, 0.4534. Four. Okay, so here's, um, so here's a situation where we start out, um, and if you think about wh where we're starting out with respect to balanced growth, we have, if you zoom in, computer enhance, we start out with um, a tiny, 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 tiny uh, disproportion in which you just have a little bit too few wage goods. The, 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 bot, the, the solid red curve is just a little bit below the, uh, the, the dotted red curve. And so you have just a small, not undersupply of wage goods, but you're on a trajectory in which you're on your way to having t way, way, way too few wage goods, way, way, way too many capital goods. Um, and, the re and, and the reason for that is because in the situation where K1 is, is greater than K2, your capital goods department is, too, is overly dependent on itself. The wage goods depend the department is also overly dependent on itself because it's, it's, it's got a lower composition, it's more labor intensive. And so you can't really solve the disproportionality problem. Capitalists end up kind of locked in to the directions that they're going in. Uh, and, you're, so, and so because the labor goods department is, is more labor intensive, and you're, you're, the economy is, is shifting more and more towards the capital goods department, uh, you get a, a, a composition of capital that simply skyrockets and, and just never never lets up until the crisis hits. And so at that point, what you have is a, is an, a, a society that rapidly becomes way, way, way more capital intensive to the point where very quickly uh, the, the, the demand for labor goes negative and then the mass layoffs start and then they just don't stop until society finally admits there's a crisis because literally everybody is unemployed and everybody is starving. So that's a pretty stark situation. Um, and it obviously doesn't mess with the argument at all that you can use this model to kind of justify a, a growing reserve army argument that's independent of a technological uh, 
independent of like kind of bias technological change. But it's the I, th I but I think that the reason that he de decided to skip this case is really because of the difference when you actually make the situation start out um, with an oversupply of wage goods. So right now, like I said, you're starting out with the disproportion in such a way that there's just a little bit too few wage goods. So if I if I start the situation with just a, a disproportion of the other sort, where I have just a little bit too many wage goods, right now I have a little bit too few because the balanced growth path is like 0.453462, um, and I, I'm missing the 62, right? Um, but if I if I start with like 0.4535, then I just have a little bit too much. Right now I just have a little bit too. Now the disproportion is the other way. I have just have a little bit too too many wage goods. Believe it or not, the situation is 100% different because if I have too many, then I'm going to keep too many and my wage goods are going to get out of control. I'm just going to have way, way, way too many wage goods and way, way too few capital goods because the disproportions cannot fix themselves. But this is the reason that I think you cannot use this argument as a full argument for a growing reserve army um, because as you can see, when you have that situation, the demand for labor simply skyrockets and it never lets up. Um, so that's pretty weird. The, the, the composition of capital plummets, uh, and, 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 and the reason for that, again, is because the, the, cap, the labor goods department are overly labor intensive. And so when society shifts towards it with like more and more favor, you're going to end up with a more and more labor intensive society. And so the demand for labor just skyrockets and it never lets up. Now, this is a very strange crisis. I find this case fascinating because, um, I mean, just look at it. What you're really looking at here, I think, is a crisis of the, a sort in which you basically, you know, you're, you're running out of capital goods, right? So if you're running out of capital goods, you're, you're, you're basically having a system, you basically have a system here where the capitalists are deciding to just care less and less about like the inputs and m care more and more about the, the consumer products to the point where the, 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 uh, the capital goods industries, like the oil industries and the machine making industries and stuff, these just become so unprofitable that everybody just disappears from them and then you just have a, a like a raw materials crisis you have some kind of like uh resource crisis like i think that's what you have to see this as is, is like ev nobody's going bankrupt and and the workers lives are getting better and better because the demand for labor is skyrocketing and so what you get instead of of the of, of a crisis that you get in all the other cases we've looked at is actually like a resource crisis i think that's how you have to see this so it's a very strange kind of crisis. I don't know what to make of this, um, but it does beg the question. Like, it, again, I, I I asked this in the last video, but I think you'll see you you understand better now why I wanted. I I, I think that this is an important question to ask about our reality. Is like which one of which reality are we in? Are we in the reality where the where the capital goods department has like a higher is like more productive than the wage goods department? Like, if you look at our global economy, it has to be one or the other. Either the either the labor goods department is more productive or the capital goods department is more productive. Which one is it? There's an answer to that question, and the answer to that question completely changes what crises in our reality are going to look like. At least these disproportionality crises, and I think that's really worth investigating. And I I haven't looked into data or anything, but like you can see, you get you get a resource crisis versus like an unemployment crisis. Like I mean, it's very very different. Um, so. You know, this doesn't exactly help the, the reserve army argument, but I also don't think it hurts it very much uh, because it's just one case out of many. And we're just basically seeing this not as like the, argu the argument for a growing reserve army. Like I said, we're seeing this as a supplementary thing to, to, to add on to a technological argument for a growing reserve army. As long as you're seeing it that way, I don't think that this one case really uh, messes things up very much. Um, but it is a fascinating case and I, I'd love to hear what other people think about it. Um, so I think that's, I don't know about you, I think that's quite a bit enough modeling uh, to do to kind of evaluate uh, our questions that we had about the reserve army. Uh, let's recall where we were at. We were asking the question, the capitalists, we'd, what we basically realized at the end of the last video is that it is socially necessary for the capitalists to find a way to reinflate the reserve army because if they don't, they're gonna see a falling rate of profit um, and that, that, that just falls indefinitely. Um, it's a much more definitive fall in the rate of profit than even the technological one. The, the reserve army drains, the workers gain bargaining power, and the capitalists just gotta find a, have got to find a way to reinflate that thing or they're going to have serious problems with the, with the continuation of their system. 
And then we noticed that one of the ways that one of the options that they had for raising the, the size of the reserve army was something that they were already going to be doing. And so we basically kind of asked the question, like, what if they just kind of didn't do anything? If they just kind of continued as we would expect them to go, like, can they manage to accomplish this task of reinflating the reserve army without actually doing anything different? And I think what these models show pretty conclusively is not only do they will not doing anything tend to solve the problem, but the tendency is so strong that they might end up with an uncontrollably growing reserve army. They might end up with a reserve army that grows faster than they can account for. They might end up with a reserve army that grows so fast that, the, that, the, that wages continually fall until you get a revolution. So again, what we're observing here are not predictions. We should never think of these things as predictions, I don't think. But we should look at this as, you know, to the extent that, that we're seeing the general law of capital accumulation as a tendency of the capitalist system, which is only half the story in my opinion. What we're seeing is that there, there is a foundational tendency within capitalism uh, for an uncontrollable rising reserve army. Um, and in that sense, what we can say about our world is that is that it, in general, a capitalist system is going to have a very hard time keeping the size of its reserve army stable. It has a built-in mechanism clearly for raising the size of the reserve army, but if left unchecked, it's actually too powerful of a mechanism. It's actually going to go too far. That's I think what you what we can conclude from all of these models combined. Uh, the, you know, so so yes, this mechanism is extraordinarily powerful. And in a sense, that's to be expected. Again, let's, you know, to refer to that kind of observation we made, I think the, the central thing to observe here has nothing to do with the rate of profit or the composition of capital. It's simply the fact that when a capitalist implements labor-saving technology, th they create like profound changes to the capitalist system as a whole. When you implement labor-saving technology, you as one person, you end up cutting a, 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 a sizable chunk of the overall workforce in the whole system because everybody has to copy you and 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 that and and if you take that and compare it to the rate at which you're reinvesting and hiring new workers th those are kind of income you know th those are you know one is very small compared to the other in terms of the effect that it has on the overall workforce so you know in long-term tendencies aside we sh you, you should always keep that in mind that in the immediate term this can be a very effective mechanism regardless of where the composition of capital is at, regardless of where, where the rate of profit is at, if you implement a big piece of labor saving technology, you're going to inflate the workforce by quite a bit. And, and, and you, know, it, it, the, you know, again, competition is sort of the driver for the capitalists to copy you here. And so that's an important kind of mechanism built that, that's necessary, but also it's kind of not because if, I, if, if you're closer to monopoly, and the monopoly capitalists implement their labor saving technology, well, they already have most of the market share already anyway. So they, they, you know, that the argument that you need the capitalists to copy you becomes less relevant. So, you know, as competition dies down, it also becomes less necessary. Um, and also, you might be saying, well, okay, if they get more of the market share, then then doesn't that increase the chances that the simple accumulation can account for the uh, 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 for for the fall? If if you know if you if you're if that if 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 you have a bigger and bigger centralized mass of surplus to reinvest, then you have a more a bigger and bigger chance for the hires the new hires due to simple accumulation to account for the technological changes. And the answer to that is actually monopoly undoes that too, because as monopoly forms, the uh, the, the the drive to reinvest weakens, and so that a number was going to fall, and so this the, and so that brings back down the rate at which you're hiring new workers due to simple accumulation, and that has nothing to do with the rate of profit again. And so whether you have a, a monopolistic system or a, or a highly competitive system, this mechanism is extremely powerful and extremely likely to be making its effects very known. And to the extent that we do it, that we do bring in an overall rising composition of capital and an overall falling rate of profit, um, we see that that tendency, the simple accumulation gets weaker and weaker and weaker in comparison to that tendency for technological change. That's another thing that we're seeing here. But in any case, uh, I'm going to end the video here. And so uh, in the next video, we're going to start out by thinking about the rate of exploitation and revisiting what it really means for the rate of exploitation to be going up in terms of the lives of the workers. And we're going to, from there, uh, come to our conclusions and, and, and get it and, and really put everything together and get a sense of what capitalist accumulation is really all about.